Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no heart, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. You are? I still am. Holy yeah. macaroni. Hey, Dan. Hello. Hello, I'm Lulu. Hello, Lulu. Lindsay. I've been down for so long. It's wild. It just keeps working out. 46 whole years, old man. <laughs> I uh, just have one quick announcement, and then we jump right into today's stories. Okay. I like your shirt. Thank you. A little 10 6 shirt. Uh, they're going to be reopening here in Coeur d'Alene before too long. Get some more New Orleans cuisine around here. So nummy. I asked TJ today if she could learn how to make macaroni pie. Nice. Uh, bringing back the classic moth design now in color form in the Bad Magic Store this week. Uh, you may have seen the black and white moth shirt, one of our very first designs, and still a bestseller today and one of my favorites. Uh, we've updated this classic fan favorite with the super cool muted neon colorway, now on tie-dye tees as well, tie-dye crew neck sweatshirts, and a coffee mug. And Creeps and Peepers will love a fresh yet familiar look with this one. So I, head, on a, head on over to badmagicmerch.com to check it out. I love a crew neck. I you love do. a crew neck sweatshirt. It's so out of control that Monroe and I, if we're anywhere, and I'm like, oh, look at that cute crew neck. She's like, nope, Lindsay, nope. You have too many. She's been known to hit my hand. Yeah, yeah. enough. I love them. Though. They're <laughs> my favorite, especially old vintage ones. Uh, what fan horror do you have for us today, crew neck lover? <laughs> this crew neck lover has two stories. My first story is called The Man in the Attic. Okay. And then my second story has, uh, the name of that story is One Word, One Name, Eleanor. Dun, oh, dun, dun. Like our niece. I know. <laughs> uh, I have two as well. The first one, the most terrifying one for me that I've told in a while. Hmm. And, I, and I like the second one a lot too. Uh, the first story, we're going to visit LA's Cecil Hotel. Oh, we're going back there? You know what? You said, we say back, I can't find an example of us being there before. I thought we had been there before too. Looked through my episode lists. Uh, every keyword search I could come up with, We've. I can't find a... Cecil Hotel story. Not even in a bonus episode? Nope. That's weird. What do they call that? Uh, um, Mandela? Mandela effect. Yeah, when you're yeah. sure that you did. I was sure did you do, Did you do the Cecil Hotel on Time Suck? Yeah, I've referenced it on Time Suck. Okay, maybe that's it. Maybe mm-hmm. that's all it took. And maybe we've like talked about it in conversation. Maybe. But not... This feels weird though, because I feel like I know where this is going. Wow. I don't, I don't think you, you do on this story. I'm having weird deja vu. Um, yeah, we're going to visit Yeah, gonna uh, visit this hotel. It's been home to a lot of murders, suicides, accidental deaths, and paranormal mysteries over the years. And at least two serial killers have called it home while they were killing. An anonymous ghost hunter and true crime junkie decided to stay there herself and got the scares of a lifetime. For my next story, we'll explore three separate locations all around Oregon's uh, Nehalem Bay. Another haunted hotel, an urban legend, and some cursed treasure. I have a lot of paranormal content this week. Okay. Y'all settled in, in and ready to begin? I am. Socked up? Yeah, I'm making a note about what I think the Cecil Hotel thing is going to be about. Because I'm matches. having the weirdest. Like, like I can already Deja hear the vu. story in my head. This is so strange. <laughs> this is its own kind of paranormal horror. Look at these fluffy tiger dog guys. We've got like <laughs> tiger stripes down the side, but like dog face. Yeah? Very cute. Tiger dog? Rawr. Okay. Then no more cute. Now horror. Uh, decent amount of historical setup on this first story before I get into the paranormal portion. In 1924, entrepreneur William Banks Hanner poured a million dollars, over $13 million in today's do- money, uh, into building a luxurious new hotel in Los Angeles, California, with an opulent marble lobby, stained glass windows, and alabaster statues. Business was good, really good, but just for the first few years. Unfortunately, the Great Depression was right around the corner. Beginning in the 1930s, the hotel and the surrounding neighborhood started to steadily fall into disrepair, and that slide has never really fully turned around. Today, the neighborhood's name has become synonymous with just about the worst place you could find yourself in all of America, Skid Row. The hotel is currently operated by the Skid Row Housing Trust, 
and was converted to 600 low-income housing units a few years back. I wonder what paranormal encounters its new tenants are currently experiencing. The building is allegedly haunted with the ghosts of the many people who have died there over the years, and possibly by the spirits of some of its most infamous and horrific former residents. By 1931, the hotel had seen its first suicide. W.K. Norton, his body was discovered in his room beside a pile of poison capsules. More suicides soon followed, over a dozen. In 1937, 25-year-old Grace E. Magro became the fourth person to die at the hotel when she fell from the ninth story, her body found tangled in a mass of telephone wires. Police were unable to determine whether her death was a suicide, an accident, or something more insidious. Several people have definitely been murdered inside the hotel. Several more have fallen from windows to their deaths. Others have died in ways deemed accidental. One of the more heartbreaking fatal incidents came in 1944 when a young woman secretly gave birth in a hotel room and then literally threw her newborn baby out of the window in a panic. At least two serial killers were long-term residents at the Cecil. Richard the Night Stalker Ramirez, who killed over 15 people from 1984, April of 1984 to August of 1985, uh, victims aged 9 to 83, and he stayed at the Cecil while committing the majority of his murders. He even disposed of evidence, including bloody clothes, in the hotel's dumpster. Years later, Austrian serial killer Jack Unterweger stayed at the Cecil. After it's he, hard to take him seriously. Unterweger? Yeah, at least the way you say it. I know. After he committed his first murder in his home country in 1974, he was captured, convicted, and sentenced. About 10 years later, he released a memoir entitled Purgatory or the Trip to Jail, Report of a Guilty Man, that became a bestseller in different parts of the world, gained Jack a lot of attention from artists and intellectuals across the world, and they then fought to convince officials he had been reformed. He had not. Uh, but they released him anyway, despite this guy having served a collective total of eight years for various offenses, including a sexual assault, before he went to prison for murder for strangling an 18-year-old woman with her own bra. His story was soon heralded as an example of the prison system's success. He was totally rehabilitated. Eventually, after being released, after serving 14 years behind bars, he began working as a journalist and public broadcasting host on the true crime beat. Stop it. His specialty was the heinous murders of sex workers, just like the crime that led to his conviction. In 1991, the career criminal and convicted murderer checked into the Cecil to cover a story about street crime in Los Angeles. Shortly after he arrived in the city, Three sex workers were attacked and killed in the exact same way that Unterweger had killed before. He was arrested months after arriving. The police were able to definitively tie the journalist to those three murders. And then soon Austrian police realized that Unterweger had not just committed those murders, but at least eight other murders back in Austria and Czechoslovakia and had started killing women within weeks of his release. Yeah, of course he did. Then as a journalist, he covered many of his own murders. Many suspect that Jack chose the Cecil specifically because of its connection to Ramirez, who he was interested in. He possibly felt drawn to its dark energy and history. We'll never know for sure what, if any, entities he encountered or summoned during his stay. Unterweger killed himself in prison the same night he was convicted of 11 murders, tying the rope he used to hang himself with the same signature knot he had used to kill at least a dozen women. Back in 2011, the proprietors of the Cecil Hotel attempted to shrug off the building's dark history by rebranding, and they renamed the Cecil Stay on Main. But less than two years later, the building received more notoriety than ever with the death of Elisa Lam, mm -hmm. a death that would inspire the fifth season of American Horror Story. Elisa was a 21-year-old Canadian tourist. In February of 2013, a hotel employee discovered her dead body floating naked in the water tank on the hotel's roof. The case was ruled an accidental drowning, but how she got into that tank is still a mystery. To get to the roof, Lamb would have needed a staff key, which was not found with her body. Her cell phone was also mysteriously missing, both from her body and from her room. But the most disturbing aspect is some security video. The night that Elisa disappeared, a security camera in the elevator captured four minutes of extremely unsettling footage. She ducks into the elevator, crouches low as if hiding, presses herself up against the wall, and occasionally peeks out into the hallway as if looking for a pursuer. Pursuer. A pursuer never seen on camera. She pushes a whole bunch of buttons, elevator doesn't move, door remains open. At one point, she even steps out into the hallway, begins gesticulating as if speaking with someone, but again, nobody is there, or possibly somebody was just off camera. Was she experiencing a mental health crisis or was she interacting with some malevolent paranormal entity? And we may have covered her before. I think that's what it is. Yeah. 
but we didn't dig into like a random guest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now for an anonymous ghost hunter's report of what they encountered at the Cecil a decade ago. Time now for the tale of the Night Stalker. I stayed at the Cecil for one night at the end of a road trip from Phoenix to Seattle back in late 2013. It was sketchy. I knew that before I paid the $98 for a premium room. I was and still am a true crime junkie, and I've been an amateur ghost hunter since I was a teenager. I was 32 when I stayed at the Cecil. I'd already seen and heard things that spooked me before that trip. A shadowy apparition one night in a cemetery in Tombstone. A disembodied voice in an abandoned haunted house in Tucson, screaming help me. A few cold spots. The feeling of being watched so many times. And I even saw a set of glowing red eyes with the guy I was dating at that time inside an abandoned hospital in Texas. What happened to the Cecil, though, that was on another level. None of that other stuff ended up keeping me up at night, off and on, for years. I checked into a room on the 14th floor, where Richard Ramirez lived. Room 1419. I don't know for sure if that's the room Richard lived in, but it's the only room the internet said he lived in. No one working at the hotel seemed to know for certain. And when I pressed uh, them about it, they seemed a little creeped out, so I let it go. When I was checking in, I was a lot more worried about the living than the dead. I parked my car a few blocks away in a secure garage so hopefully no one would break in or attack me as I got in or out, and then I walked right at dusk past more than a few people I did not risk making eye contact with. I wasn't nervous about my room at all at this point. I couldn't wait to be inside it. I just hoped the room would be secure. And it was. Maybe a bit too secure. The door had four locks on it. A bolt, a button, and two different latches. And that didn't exactly make me feel great. No hotel has that many locks on the doors unless people breaking into the rooms is a serious problem that happens a lot. Also, I hadn't actually seen this in a while. The key to the door was an actual key. No fancy magnetized readers at the Cecil. No fancy anything. The lobby looked really nice, I'll say that. You could tell it used to be really beautiful, elegant even, but that was about it. A bed, a chair, a stool, and a small TV were the only amenities I had in my room. And the TV didn't really work. I immediately hung the Do Not Disturb sign on the outside of my door. I brought in a bottle of red wine, some snacks, a change of clothes, and all my toiletries. I wouldn't need to leave my room until the following morning. There was no one else staying there I wanted to run into until I was checking out. On the way up to my room in the elevator, I rode most of the way with this creepy guy who kept silently moving his lips like he was talking to someone else I couldn't see in a voice I also couldn't hear. And every once in a while, he would shoot me a look out of the corner of his eye and then laugh. That was fun. He also rode the elevator with me all the way up from the second floor to the 14th, then stayed in it when it started to go back down. Weird. I'd never seen that one before. Haven't seen it since either. And then when I got to my room, the door across the hall opened just a tiny bit. And some older woman peered at me with one wild eye from the crack, then slammed the door shut after just a few seconds. Ghosts or not, I knew early on it was going to be an eventful night. I couldn't get any channels on the TV to come in clearly enough to be worth watching, so I just sat up in bed, scrolling through my phone and Instagram. I didn't even bother to pour myself a glass of wine. There were no glasses or cups in my room, no coffee maker or anything. So I just drank from the bottle. It seemed fitting, actually. When in Rome, right? After I'd been there around an hour, at about 9 p.m., I heard a crazy argument upstairs in the room above me. I couldn't make out a lot of the words, but it sounded like some woman and her boyfriend, client maybe, she was calling him every name in the book. The door slammed and then it was stomping down the hall, then pounding on the door, then more yelling, both of them this time, then the door slamming again, and then more stomping away from the room. I wondered, how would I even know if I heard a ghost, with all the other noise around me? The walls felt so thin. It was never totally quiet. I could always at least hear a TV from the room next door. The lady across the hall seemed to open and slam her door every 30 minutes or so. And it sounded like someone else down the hall never shut their door and had invited five or six of their noisiest friends over. It was crazy. If you weren't already losing your mind when you ended up here, I wondered how long would it take you to lose it after checking in? Not long after hearing that argument above me, I got up to use the bathroom. And when I was washing my hands in the sink, they did provide me with one comically small bar of soap. I gasped when I looked in the mirror and saw the shadow of a man standing on the far side of my bed against the wall. I started to scream, no, as I spun around but then stopped because there was no one there. It was just a human-ish shaped shadow projected from outside the window. 
my heart rate still up a bit, I walked over to the window to check out the view and decided to crack it open. It opened easily, too easily, and it opened all the way. I couldn't believe it, no safety lock. Not even after all the people jumping out or being thrown out off the top floors over the years. It would have been so easy to jump or fall. The window was so big. I shut it, I wanted to lock it shut, but the window didn't have a lock for that either. I did not like that. And as I stood there and looked out, I thought about the shadowy shape I'd seen just for a moment in the mirror that I now knew wasn't a man, but still, my mind kept flashing on the thought of that guy standing right behind me, pushing me out. I shuddered. I closed the drapes and climbed into bed. A sliver of light from the nearby buildings and city in general still slipped into my room, just enough to let me see all kinds of shadows. Instead of scrolling more on my phone, I decided to just lay there with my eyes open. I was doing some ghost hunting, so I thought I might as well lean into feeling a little spooked and just see what happened. What quickly happened was me not being able to focus on listening to anything other than the leaky shower faucet. Drip, 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 drip. It was weirdly loud. I couldn't believe I hadn't noticed it before. I didn't really want to leave my bed, but it was driving me crazy. I decided to get up and see if I could throw a towel down beneath it to mute the sound a bit if I couldn't get the actual dripping to stop. Walking into the bathroom, I froze right before I pushed the shower curtain aside. All of a sudden, I became convinced there was something on the other side of it. Something, someone standing in the bathtub, waiting to grab me. I tried to think, did I look inside the shower right when I checked in? Usually I was so good about that. But did I do that this time? Or had I been thrown off my normal travel routine by thinking about the guy in the elevator and the lady across the hall? My heart was pounding. If some guy was in my room with me the whole time, I would have heard him, right? Right? No one could be that quiet for that long, could they? But the hotel was noisy. Shit. Should I run out to the hallway? But what if someone worse is out there? What if no one is in my shower, but there is someone terrible who will do something terrible to me out in the hallway? So many thoughts were running through my head. I decided the smartest thing to do would be to throw back the shower curtain. There were definitely some sketchy guys outside my door, but inside my room, probably not. Very likely not. I counted down from three inside my head to get psyched up. Three. Two. One. Bam! I slammed back the curtain so fast that I had the curtain rod off the wall and it fell down in a heap. And there was no one standing in the tub, thank God. I tried to turn off the water, but it was already turned off. There would be no fixing this leak. I left the curtain in a heap, grabbed a towel, and went to place it under the dripping. And I screamed. There was a human fucking eyeball looking up at me from the drain. But it vanished after what seemed like less than a second. It was just there for the briefest moment, or was it? Had I imagined it? Holy shit, it looked so real. And it looked like just one of the Night Stalker's eyes. I'd seen so many pictures of him in articles I'd read over the years, I knew what it looked like. I quickly convinced myself I'd imagined it, and then I flashed on the mirror. I felt a wave of dread wash over me. Without even looking, I knew something was in my room, and it was looking at me through the mirror. I could feel it. When I dared to glance, ah, holy shit, there was a guy in my room. Not just a shadow this time, but a real guy standing there in the dark. But then I whipped around and actually looked, and he was gone. But then when I looked back in the mirror, he was still there, grinning, the Night Stalker. He had died just a few months earlier, and now his ghost must be back at the Cecil. But again, when I actually looked in the room, nothing. I raced out of the bathroom and slammed the door shut behind me. I moved a chair in front of the bathroom door. If I had to go to the bathroom again, I would piss on the damn floor. I was still too scared to leave my room. Bam, bam, bam! Someone was pounding on the door. Thank God for those four locks. I looked out the peephole, and there was no one standing there. But the woman across the hall had her door cracked open again, and I could see her one eye staring right at me before she slammed it. Ah! The eye from the bathroom was now looking into the peephole from the hallway. I scrambled backwards and started stumbling, and I couldn't stop stumbling. I had to throw my arms out not to slam into the window and then fall, you know, to my death. I'm convinced something was propelling me towards that window and wanted me to crash through it. When I picked myself up, I screamed again. The bathroom door had flung itself open. Shit, shit, shit. I looked around me and couldn't see anything. But what would be in the mirror? It was beckoning me. It wanted to show me something. I felt compelled to see. I crouch walked over to the edge of the bathroom, reached my hand inside without looking, and turned on the light. And then slowly, I stood fully up and turned and faced the mirror. 
and just about passed out. The Night Stalker was standing right behind me, evil grin on his face. He grabbed me by the hair with one hand, yanking me back, and with the other he pulled a knife in front of my neck, pressed it against my throat, pushed it in and pulled it across. He slit my fucking throat. It felt so real. I could feel blood pouring down my chest. I couldn't breathe. I tried to spin out of his grip and I couldn't. I tried to scream but I couldn't. I couldn't suck in air or push it out thanks to the gaping wound in my neck. Everything started to fade to black. Bam! I hit the floor hard and snapped back to reality. I reached for my throat. No blood. No cut. No one else in the room with me. But I knew he was still there. He was still in the mirror. I shut the door without looking, grabbed all my shit that wasn't in the bathroom, threw it into my suitcase as fast as I could. I grabbed my keys, jammed on my shoes, undid all four locks as fast as I could. But then the door wouldn't open. I pulled and pulled, but it wouldn't open. Bam! The bathroom door flung open again and the light turned on. I was screaming, screaming and pulling. And then the door that flung open, I almost lost my balance, stumbled backwards towards the window again, but hung on. Just barely, but I hung on and launched myself into the hallway. The woman had her door cracked open again, but now it wasn't her looking out into the hallway. I knew it was Ramirez. I screamed and ran to the elevator and hit the button over and over again for the lobby. And right before it made it to my floor, someone came out of my room, the Night Stalker. I screamed and then the elevator doors opened and I jumped inside, hit the lobby button, hit the closed doors button. The doors closed just in time to keep him out. In my panic, I didn't even realize someone else was in the elevator. That weird guy from earlier. The one having the silent conversation. He unfortunately was not silent anymore. He was looking directly at me and he just kept repeating. You see him too. You see him too. You see him too. Over and over and over. I wanted to scream, shut up. But instead I just burst into tears. I wanted to be out of there to get out and never come back. Finally the doors opened. I burst out. I was worried that the guy was going to follow me. But when I looked back, he was gone. Just vanished. It was just me and the night clerk in the lobby. I ran over to the desk, tossed the key on the counter. Everything okay, miss? He asked clearly knowing I was a long way from okay. What happened? The 14th floor is a madhouse. No one should ever fucking stay there, I yelled. He looked even more concerned when he said, you are the only one up there tonight. I didn't say anything else. What was the point? I have expected him to morph into the Night Stalker right in front of me and cut my throat again. I ran, literally sprinted as fast as I could all the way to my car. I jumped in, drove out of that garage, drove all the way out of LA that night. I ended up checking in some Hampton, Hampton Inn, some new, very lit up, very corporate and boring Hampton Inn, Hampton Inn in Santa Clarita. It was perfect. I slept with all the lights on and the TV on and the TV set to the Disney Channel. Believe it or not, I still did a bit more ghost hunting on that trip with some friends I met up with in Seattle. I figured it would pale in comparison to whatever I experienced that night at the Cecil and thank God I was right. I needed to get back on the horse and have it be okay. I still have no idea what happened to the Cecil. And honestly, I think it's best that way. What do you think happened? I don't know. The building got in her head, just made her like hallucinate a bunch of crazy stuff. Yeah, I, I was waiting for her to wake up from a bad dream. Like I was mm-hmm. thinking like, oh, she just got to her room, chugged her bottle of wine, passed out and was just in and out of like a bad, bad, bad dream. Yeah, I did feel like kind of like a fever dream. Like maybe she was like half awake mm-hmm. or something. But I mean, we've had that happen in other stories too, where something's playing with your imagination mm-hmm. and making you think whatever you are afraid of most is actually happening. I was having a hard time not laughing at the guy in the elevator when you first started talking about him. Yeah. Because I was thinking about how funny that would be to do to other people. <laughs> Like in a creepy hotel, just go just, on the Just any hotel. Oh, like ride up with them to their floor yeah. and then just- And be having a- Yeah, like a weird little convers- silent conversation. And then like really <laughs> animated. <laughs> and what made me think about that was that you were telling the kids recently about how you and a buddy of yours did that in the truck on the way to school, maybe when you were younger. Oh, kind of. We, when in high school, yeah, yeah. me and Jason Sebasco, we, um, well, we were stoned. Yeah. And we were smoking weed in the truck on the way to school. And then Burke, this kid Burke was sitting in the middle of us and, and we would decide beforehand that we we're going to do this. And we would pretend at a certain point, like he's getting stoned too, to just make m- move our mouths, but not have any sound come out <laughs> and make him think that like he was that high, like that he was, he couldn't hear anything anymore. <gasps> and he was kind of an excitable guy and it would work. He's like, stop, stop it, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. But otherwise, really fun story. I mean, not fun for her. Yeah. But. Intense Maybe. night. Yeah. Got some, yeah. She got some stuff. Before you started telling that story and you were talking about the Cecil Hotel and I was having the... Yeah, deja vu. Yeah, yeah. It definitely was the Elisa Lamb story because I remember her like, I wrote down girl, floors, 
uh, staying there. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. exactly what I was thinking yep. of. Yeah, that's a great yeah, so I, story. So I guess we have been there before for Lisa, but I don't think we focus on the hotel. No, we focus on her. And I think we talk a little bit about, but yeah, t- nominally. Uh, I have a few pictures. I, this first one is just a picture of the Cecil. I mean, it is, you know, it was a really cool looking hotel when it was built. Um, yeah, that's clearly now. Yeah, former resident and serial killer Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker here. Oh, he, oh yeah, the hand. Very distinctive look. And this next one is the uh, former resident and another serial killer, that Jack Unterweger. Unterweger. The Austrian. Gosh, he like, he's a more scary serial killer to me than Richard Ramirez because Ramirez looks like a freaking serial killer. I know. This guy just looks like some very well-to-do businessman. Yeah, we're going to do his story coming up. It reminded me, I've thought about it before, but then this episode, I already like uh, emailed uh, Sophie and Olivia and I'm like, hey, let's add this to the list. Mm-hmm. Because it is a crazy example of, man, he uh, hoodwinked or yeah. you know, tricked for like, but like so many of like the uh, intellectual elite in Austria and he became this symbol of like, everybody can be rehabilitated. And, and he wrote this Just book. It's not true. Nope, it's not true. And all, and all these artists, you know, like bleeding hearts really rallied around him. And it's like, what did you like his whole backstory was sexual crimes, you know, like murder. It's like, you don't make this progression. He was like in jail more than he was not in jail by far for the majority of his adult life. Yeah. Like only free for like month here, a couple months there. And, um, and then he just figured out how to run a new scam and tricked everybody. And then he started killing immediately when he got released, like within like a few weeks. Yeah. A, a serial killer rehabilitating. I don't know if that's ever happened. And it's very different to be in prison for, repetitive planned crimes as yeah. opposed to like uh, a crime of passion or something. Yeah. I was just going to say like con air, you know, just like, like a yeah, common yeah, yeah. reference we all know, just like, so, you know, that's different than uh, being a, a child who grows up in extreme poverty and you're forced to join a gang for your own safety yeah, yeah, yeah. and you kill somebody and then you go to prison. That is so different than somebody yeah. who has a pattern and a yeah, system. Yeah, there was an escalation and, beforehand. Yeah, and he only killed on. the one person that they know of before he went, you know, but it's like, but there was a, a rape like before that and he was, there was a pattern developing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah, I can't think of a single example of somebody like that mm-hmm. who like truly gets rehabilitated. I think there, I, I deeply believe there are certain lines. If you cross, that's it. You are fucked forever. I think so. There's no coming back from that. I think so. I think so. I think like the best it gets is that you're like in the nicest kind of prison there is. Right. Exactly. But in prison, you stay. Yep. Yep. Sorry. Um. Anything else? No. I just, I really like my note. I really want to play this game in an elevator now. <laughs> so you're ready to leave the Cecil for the Oregon coast? I wish that our building had an elevator in it. Yeah. What if I just started running up and down the stairs a lot? <laughs> That'd be weird. Yeah. <laughs> While talking to myself, but not. Oh, yeah. You probably, you probably should do that at a building you don't work at. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I imagine like our landlord who we know quite well being like, uh, Dan, is Lindsay <laughs> completely cracked? That's good. That was interesting. Okay. Off to Oregon we go. Time now for the tale of the Bandage Man, Cursed Treasure, and more. The Bandage Man. There are all kinds of places in Oregon that claim to be haunted, but the area around Nehalem Bay boasts a particularly interesting mix of the unexplained and paranormal, from hidden and possibly cursed Spanish treasure, to a haunted hotel, to an urban legend that has terrified local teens for decades. So we'll start with the hotel. The tiny town of Wheeler, just over 400 people, on the Oregon coast, about 90 minutes west of Portland, is reported to have a few haunted locations, including the old Wheeler Hotel. Construction on the old Wheeler started in 1920. The new hotel replaced two different wooden hotels that were previously built in the same property. It was constructed during a lumber boom, but due to the Great Depression, just like the last story, and a series of forest fires, the local timber industry and town's economy was based on, uh, was devastated, and the place fell into a state of disrepair. The property was then purchased and salvaged in 1940 by Dr. Harvey Reinhardt, who opened an experimental arthritis clinic that actually ended up becoming extremely popular. Patients across the country, even from abroad, came to the little Oregon town for treatment all the way until the 1980s. And then the building became vacant for about a decade. In 1998, Mary Ann and Winston Laszlo purchased the property and turned it back into a hotel, and it remains a hotel now. And ever since the property was transformed back into its original purpose, there have been reports of the building being haunted. The Laszlo's have said that it felt like something in the building was working against them when they first started remodeling, that it felt like some unseen force was causing a number of construction disasters and setbacks. They became so frustrated, they reached out to a ghost hunter named Martina Delude to see if she could help. 
she emailed Winston the following. Ghosts that haunt residential and business locations become very threatened when someone starts changing things that they are accustomed to. Some spirits actually become incensed when furniture is moved around. Just like the living, most spirits do not like change. Possibly as soon as they realize that it was once again going to become a hotel, perhaps sometime, uh, something they remember, they'll decide to help you along instead of stifling your efforts. Well, the couple did push on with the renovations and soon it did seem as if the spirits relaxed and accepted them. Construction finished without further problems, but the ghost didn't go away. The couple continued to report all kinds of paranormal activity. Winston seems to have had the most intense experiences. He said he was once looking into a mirror when he distinctly saw a man sitting in the chair behind him. He didn't recognize him as a guest, so he turned around to speak to him, ask if he needed any help, but now the chair was completely empty. In 2009, Katie Brown and Greg Nichols purchased the old Wheeler and soon became familiar with its many spirits, some of which Katie has named Permanence, appropriately named for their permanent presence inside the building. She believes that there is a permanent ghost in room three nicknamed Walter. Apparently, Walter particularly enjoys messing with the hotel staff. When a bed is freshly made in room three, a staff member will often soon find an indentation on the mattress as if someone has recently been sitting there. The ghost reportedly also enjoys watching TV, as evidenced by reports of the TV turning on by itself in the middle of the night. And super creepy, Katie has claimed that the TV always plays the same black and white movie, a movie on a TV station that doesn't exist. Katie says she's not scared by any of this. She believes that the hotel is a place where ghosts from different historical eras have gathered and that some of the spirits might be patients from the arthritis clinic who are returning to a place that brought them healing and happiness. And Katie is far from the only person to experience activity in recent years. The Paranormal Society of Portland came out and explored the hotel, and they claimed to have captured video evidence of an apparition crossing the room twice while investigators were sleeping. Historian and paranormal researcher Jay Verberg from a group called Oregon Paranormal uh, said he was once staying in room five when he clearly saw his doorknob move. Then suddenly the door swung uh, open, no one was there, and he never heard anyone sneaking down the hall after this happened. He tried to recreate this movement to see if the door had some kind of problem with its latch, just wouldn't close properly, but then he found that the door actually shut very tightly. Another paranormal researcher, Casey Go uh, Goodwin, was staying at the hotel when he heard women talking in one of the nearby rooms. He knew he was the only guest at that time, so he went and knocked on their door asking if anyone was inside. As soon as he knocked and spoke, the voices stopped and never started up again. He heard no movement from inside the room, never heard the sounds of anyone leaving. Co-owner Katie Brown's assistant, Rain, has claimed numer uh, numerous paranormal experiences there. She said she was once cleaning the stairs when she felt a hand touch her head. She was alone at the time, but unlike the subjects of most ghost encounter stories, was not terrified. Rather, the presence felt friendly to her. She said it felt like someone was thanking her for her work. Rain was also in the building when Katie was painting the hotel's lobby one day. Katie said goodbye to the final guests, assumed it was now just her and Rain alone in the building. Rain was on the upper floor. After the guests left, Katie heard music coming from the Victrola, a type of phonograph in the upstairs office. She asked Rain about the music. Rain didn't hear it, and she was not in the office near the Victrola. Uh, Katie also frequently reports her dog waking up out of a deep sleep and barking at the door, when of course no one is ever on the other side when she opens it. But again, none of this really bothers her. None of the staff and guests have reported feeling frightened or having a negative encounter with these spirits. But the spirits living in the basement are apparently another story. Katie does not like to venture down there, neither does Rain. At one time, the basement served as the town morgue, and to this day, gives off some kind of negative energy. Many people refuse to go into the basement altogether. Nothing terrible has ever been witnessed, or uh, if it has, it hasn't been reported. Just that bad vibes in a building full of all sorts of strange energy. According to Katie Brown, there are three to four inexplicable incidents every day at the hotel, making the paranormal part of everyday operations at the Old Wheeler Hotel. Okay, next going to examine a, a local urban legend. The infamous Bandage Man of Cannon Beach is another example of the paranormal around Nehalem Bay. Cannon Beach is less than 20 short miles straight up the coast from Wheeler. The legend of the Bandage Man seems to have originated in the 1930s or 40s, depending on sources. Most of the encounter stories come from the 50s and 60s. Bandage Man appears just as his name describes. Most encounter reports describe this figure as a man covered in bloody bandages, reeking of rotting flesh. The figure is said to appear on stormy nights on Highway 101 and the Route 26 overpass, forests, beaches, and occasionally around bars in or near Cannon Beach. The 
first known encounter story comes from sometime in the 1950s. A young couple were sitting together in their truck near the beach, thinking they were alone in a secluded area. In the midst of some romance, they suddenly felt the truck shift as if someone had climbed into the bed. When they turned around to look, they started screaming. They saw a man covered in bloody bandages, and then he started beating on the windows and trying to break in. They sped away, sped away in terror down the road. Shortly after starting to drive, the bloody man had disappeared without ever having made any of the sounds you'd expect someone to make if they were a real person falling out of the back of a truck. And where is Bandage Man thought to have come from? The primary origin story is that Bandage Man was once a logger, severely injured while working. He was covered in bandages by first responders, and then tragically the ambulance that took him to the hospital was swept away in a landslide. And when rescue workers arrived to get the vehicle, the injured logger was nowhere to be found. Reports of this entity were once so frequent, there used to be a section of Highway 101 locally known as Bandage Man Road. For years, it was a rite of passage for teenagers who just got their licenses to drive down this stretch of highway at night. Because of this, most of the alleged encounter tales do come from teenagers, a lot of them pretty similar to the encounter I just already shared. Bandage Man almost always appears inside the bed of a truck or sometimes inside convertible cars with their tops down, suddenly sitting in the back seat. The entity vanishes before the driver ever reaches town. Most of the drivers who have claimed to have seen Bandage Man didn't even realize he was in the vehicle with them until they smelled a foul, rotten odor, followed by seeing his terrifying figure in the rearview mirror. Finally, uh, we head to Manzanita, Oregon, small beach town of just around 600 people living in uh, the Nehalem Bay area, less than five miles from Wheeler. Uh, Neocani Mountain, one of the highest mountains on the Oregon coast, overlooks a beach adjacent to town. There is allegedly treasure buried somewhere on or around Neocani Mountain, which many have tried to find over the past two centuries. The legend of the buried treasure comes from the Nehalem tribe, who told stories of it to the first white settlers of Nehalem Bay. According to legend, a group of 17th century Spanish sailors wrecked in the bay at the base of Neocani Mountain, and their ship carried a chest full of treasure. Some of the Spanish explorers carried the chest to an area either on or right beneath the mountain where they dug a large hole, placed the chest inside, and then murdered an enslaved African who was with them. His body was placed on top of the chest and buried, as some kind of preventative measure, possibly part of some curse ritual to keep anyone from uncovering the treasure. Then the captain allegedly shot and buried all the other crew members who accompanied him to the site of the buried treasure, possibly again as part of some curse that would bring tragedy to anyone other than him if they found the treasure. And then he returned to his damaged ship, now the only person who knew where the treasure was buried. And then he and the other survivors of the shipwreck traveled to Mexico on their longboat. Before ever being able to return to recover his treasure, the captain died, and with him, knowledge of where the treasure was hidden. Generations of treasure seekers have tried to find it. Because of the volume of treasure seekers, Neocani Mountain soon became known to some as the Mountain of a Thousand Holes. So many pits and trenches have been dug there. According to both a 1931 and a 1990 newspaper article, there are two large boulders on the face of the mountain called Treasure Rock, and it is believed the treasure is not far from these boulders. A mysterious inscription that has never been deciphered was apparently found here. Sadly, at least, uh, at least three people have died while searching for the treasure, which some think is due to the treasure's curse. In 1931, 68 year old Charles Wood and 42 year old Lynn Wood, a father and son treasure hunting duo, dug a 30 foot hole in the beach looking for it and then died together in a cave in. As reported by The World, an old newspaper printed in Coos Bay on August 11, 1931, The men were crushed to death in a sand pit where they believed they had located the legendary fortune by means of a gold-finding contrivance of their own invention. Kenneth Wood's uh, 11-year-old son, or Kenneth Wood, excuse me, Lynn's 11-year-old son, told the paper that his father and grandfather had been digging for a week. Lynn even wrote to his wife and said, we have located the treasure and we're going to get tools to hunt for it. The men went missing around 10.30 a.m. on Friday, August 7th. Charles and Lynn had started digging that morning, told Kenneth to come back at 11.30. He returned to the beach to find a coat, hat, hammer, and hatchet, but his grandfather and father were gone. Kenneth had promised to keep their operations a secret, which is why rescue efforts did not start until the next day. Kenneth wandered around the beach until the evening when he met another boy, told him that his dad and grandpa were missing. On the 8th, Kenneth finally told the boy's parents that the men had been digging for treasure. Rescue workers came and saw the walls of the sand pit had collapsed, 
It was not known if these men were in the pit at that time, but it was assumed that they'd been buried by the collapsing sand. And that assumption was soon proven right. Lynn Wood's body was removed from the sand shaft first, followed by his father, Charles. Six decades later, in May of 1990, two more men were searching for the treasure. When they were swept out to sea, only one of them would survive. 37-year-old Samuel Logan went missing on May 26, 1990, when he and his friend Bill Rice were searching a cave at the foot of the mountain, and then a big riptide swept them out to sea. Only Bill managed to make it back. On June 25th, the badly decomposed body was found washed ashore at Manzanita, and the clothing matched Samuel's last known description. The government used to actually give permits to treasure hunters looking for this treasure. They did that from 1967 to 1999, but then the so-called treasure trove statute was repealed, which made hunting on the mountain and beaches illegal. Is there actually buried, possibly cursed treasure in this area? Historical records do add some credibility to the possibility of the legends being true. Archaeological analysis concluded that a Spanish ship, a ship named Santo Cristo de Burgos, or de Burgos, likely did wreck at the Nehalem, oh my gosh, on the Nehalem spit, that word never wants to flow off my tongue. In 1693, the Spanish trading ship, referred to as a Manila galleon, was supposed to sail from Manila, Philippines to Acapulco, Mexico. The ship was carrying literal tons of beeswax, rare silks, and Chinese porcelain, and maybe some secret treasure. According to a 2008 Seattle Times article, chunks of beeswax have been turning up on the northern coast of Oregon in the Nehalem and Manzanita area for centuries. In 1705, another ship called the San Francisco Xavier also disappeared while carrying about 75 tons of beeswax per shipping records. The beeswax was traced back to the Philippines based on the wings of native bees that were found in the wax, which further supports that it came from those two ships. At the time the ship wrecked, beeswax was required by the Catholic Church for candles, and there were no honeybees in the New World, so churches had to import it. Adding more credence to the possibility of a shipwreck in the area, researchers from Portland State University have cited stories from local indigenous people that literally describe sailors coming ashore and burying a large te- chest of something on the mountain. Records from the 1800s also showed that these same people traded beeswax to settlers arriving in the Pacific Northwest. The earliest written reference to the shipwreck dates back to 1813. Fur trader Alexander Hendry noted that the Clatsop people traded great quantities of beeswax and said it came from a shipwreck near Nehalem Bay. Furniture and souvenirs were reportedly built from the ship's timbers. Hendry identified the ship as a Spanish ship, but historians don't know how he made that conclusion. In 2011, Scott Williams, president of the Maritime Archaeological Society, and his team concluded that the shipwreck could be dated back to the late 17th century based on the designs of some porcelain shards that have washed up uh, on shore over the centuries. Finally, according to records from the Spanish government, only two Manila galleons went missing off the Pacific coast in the late 17th century, the Santa Cristo de Burgos and the San Francisco Xavier. Then in 2022, archaeologists entered some caves on the coast and found a dozen timbers believed to have come from the Santa Cristo. Scott Williams told the Washington Post he was 90% sure the timbers came from that ship. So the ship for sure existed, does seem to have wrecked near Nehalem Bay. And it's very possible that some of the Spaniards on board, according to local oral traditions, could have buried a chest of something in the area. Other than treasure, what would be in it? Will it ever be found? And is it actually cursed? Nehalem Bay is full of mysteries with paranormal possibilities that continue to draw in paranormal enthusiasts and treasure seekers to this day. What is, what did they die in a sand trap? Yeah, like dug down and just probably didn't have it like um, fortified correctly and it just caved in. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't think you could ever convince me to go down into the sand. Yeah, mine shaft and sand sounds like a really, really bad idea. Yeah, just too unstable. Mm-hmm. And on the beach where the they would run into water underneath, you know, oh fairly quickly. It reminds me of Oak Island. Treasure hunters have tried to, get, you know, find this su- supposed treasure, which I don't think actually exists. Is it there? In Oak Island for, you know, Years and years and years, and so many collapses, and they never find anything, and it's super dangerous. Isn't the joke on Oak Island that the update is that there is no update? Yeah, on the Secret Suck for uh, a long time, probably for like two years, I did an Oak Island update, and yeah, <laughs> every week, for every two week, years. yeah, and it was just like, nope, still nothing. But the uh, the show on the History Channel seems to uh, draw on viewers still. Oh my gosh, is it a new show? No, it's been going for years and years. I, I haven't looked in the last year or so to see if it's still active, but it was like I think it was just called the Curse of Oak Island, maybe. And it just like, yeah, went on season after season. It was the network's biggest show, highest rated wow. show. And a show of just like, it just cracks me up where it's like, it's a show based in nothing. It's just guys 
trying to find something who literally season after season never find anything interesting. Hmm. And people are like, maybe next year. Let's try again. Uh, the sand thing makes me nervous because when we were kids and we would go on vacation, we would borrow my dad's best friend's SUV so that we could mm -hmm. like drive it on the beach. Fun. And one time, it almost we almost went out to sea in the beach or in the uh, in the vehicle in the vehicle because my dad was not following the rules because my dad is a rule breaker and he really likes to test limits as yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's like, if this is the sand and this is the ocean and, you know, there's like signs everywhere that's like, don't get, and we got stuck in like wet sand for a little while Ooh. and it got real, oh, my mom was losing her ever loving mind. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Yeah. It was really scary for a few yeah. minutes because it was like starting to come up. It came up over the tires a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Oh, dad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, dad. Lucked out. Yeah, he did. Uh, here's some pictures. This first one, somewhat recent picture of the old Wheeler Hotel. Wheeler. It's oh, little, okay. Two story little boutique hotel now. Honestly, if you put like the right second story uh, um, porch yeah. on it, uh -huh. uh, you could like it could look like it's in New Orleans. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that style of construction. Mm -hmm. uh, this next one, the inside of room three, doesn't look too spooky during the day, but maybe at night. It just looks old. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's dated. Yeah, like it looks like a bed and breakfast. Yeah. Uh, this next one, someone's vision of Cannon Beach's bandage man. Ooh. So that'd be pretty creepy. There was that story in Ojai, right? Yep. Uh-huh. Charman. So, Charman. I was ready. I'm like, what was it? That could be a duo. <gasps> uh, and then here's a pic of some Nahalem Bay treasure hunters. I'm not having terrible like thoughts. Like the bandage man is like, hey man, do you need some bandages? <laughs> right, right. So you're looking rough. Hang on, here, here. here I got extra. <laughs> uh, this next one is a yeah pick of uh, some Nahalem Bay treasure hunters from back in 1985 or this is the cast of Goonies <laughs> I was like wait a second what yeah this, uh, <laughs> this looks all too familiar Goonies was based uh, you know somewhat on this supposed you know lost it treasure was? Mm -hmm. oh, like funny. the treasure in Oregon uh, Richard oh. Donner the film's director when Chunk aka Jeff Cohen yes and when his acting career slowed down Paid for him to go to college. He became a lawyer. And then we have actually uh, hired him to do some contract stuff over he, the years. Jeff Cohen is our lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> one, cool. one of our many attorneys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool dude. Uh-huh. Yeah, really nice guy. We've never brought it up. We've never said like, hey, Chunk. No. Chunk. Huh? <laughs> Could you imagine? We've never asked him to do the truffle shuffle. <gasps> which I'm sure he's been asked uh, I bet that's like, like hundreds of times. I bet when he's meeting with new clients, if mm -hmm. they he's even- He's very fit, by the way. Very fit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel like if anybody asks him like to do it, mm -hmm. that's it. They're immediately off his roster. Probably. You don't get to be his client if you ask him shitty things like that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, I had questions about a sand trap. Thank you for explaining that. Mm -hmm. I was, that made me very nervous. I was like, what are they doing? Stop digging in the sand. Yeah. Uh, the Ojai story. Oh, uh, would you stay at a hotel if you were the only guest in a hotel? Well, I know like it's some of these supposedly haunted like smaller hotels. It's not that uncommon where um, they will, I mean, you know, it depends on how, obviously how much traffic they're getting, but if it's a little like random house that's been converted into a bed and breakfast or whatever, yeah. or a small hotel, they will actually let you rent out the whole thing for a weekend for, for specifically for like ghost hunting and stuff. Sure. That's, that's not what I'm asking you. I'm not asking you if you would rent mm. out an entire hotel. I'm saying you get to this small hotel, maybe it's a B&B, &B, whatever, and you are the only person outside of the like the caretaker or the receptionist staying there do you check in or do you just say eh, i'm good and go to the next place i mean i guess you know it depends on what kind of vibe i'm picking up but i might stay there oh not me yeah maybe if i'm with you i'm okay but by mm -hmm. myself no way mm -hmm. yeah i might like put a chair in front of the door i might be like a little bit more i'm like is that clerk gonna try and sneak in here that's like, right yeah that's right we had that creepy hotel story last week from you like the girl, the domestic abuse, she was trying to get away from the guy, and then she goes to the hotel. Oh, the that's right. The, the sun. Sundowner? No. no. Sun, Sunway. Sunway. The, the sun downer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then uh, that was a new thing that I thought at, uh, to me that like a ghost will get on board. Like if you're living in a home that definitely has ghosts and you're remodeling or whatever, like if you just keep at it, yeah. they'll eventually get on board when they realize you're trying to restore it. I never heard that before. Yeah, I hadn't either, actually, from that, like, go with that ghost hunter's advice. Yeah, I feel like she's full of it. Right, yeah. I'm well, they're all guessing. Maybe. Right? Maybe it's some like, of them know a little bit more than yeah, others. Yeah, some of them are going to have more experience than others, but I mean, nobody nobody knows the rules for sure. I know all the rules. I'm just I'm not sharing think, them because I yeah. think it's more fun to just like have you continually guessing. <laughs> You gotta, who are you gonna hang on to? Baby Boff or, oh, okay. No, 
We got this little Layla here. People get really upset if you say the other one's name a lot. I know. I know. Remember when we got that and I like held on to it for a few weeks? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably the most hate mail I've gotten in the course of a month. Yeah. I was really, it's just so cute. It is cute. They and did will, such a good job with it. And I will say, uh, Baphomet is not some biblical demon, by the way. Like, like people, like, it, it, Baphomet didn't exist as a concept. Like, wasn't written about, wasn't mentioned until the Knights Templars got in, like, uh, this dispute about money mm-hmm. with the King of France. Yeah. And the thought is that he made up a bunch of accusations of these guys being demonic worshipers. Uh-huh. Because he didn't want to pay back the crazy amount of money he owed them. Funny. And what he was able to do is get them all hanged and then just take their stuff instead of, you know, having to pay them. Because he had helped them in some wars, some crusade stuff. Uh-huh. It's a whole thing. It's like a whole historical thing. And that's where Baphomet comes out of testimony against the Templars by some guy that it seems like the king bribed to make up a bunch of shit. So, so there's no bait. It's a, it's a completely made up boogeyman. So I can say Baphomet as much as I want? People still get mad because people don't care about history. Oh. <laughs> but people, well, people, I feel like I'm now going to get some emails about what you just said. Well, I didn't say it. Dan did. Dan did. I stand by it. Okay. A lot of people in this country don't give a shit about history. <laughs> well, he's fired up today. I'm not even fired up. It's just a fact. Fired. It's just like people just have a lot of strong opinions about things they have not looked into at all. Is this because you're like really hot in here right now? No, I'm, I'm not fired I'm up at all. I'm teasing you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I just keep saying you're fired up, you'll get more fired up, which is- <laughs> I, I know, of- that is a funny thing. When someone's not actually upset, and like, just calm down. You're like, no, nah, I'm fine. I'm like, calm it's down. Okay. Take a deep calm breath. Calm down. Take a deep breath. <laughs> nah, and then pretty soon you're like, yeah, now nah, I'm fucking pissed. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of my favorite things to do to you. Oh, yeah, it's great. Okay. Well, I do have two stories this week. And I'm ready to tell them if you're ready to listen. I would love to listen to them. You would love to? Yeah. Okay, well, our first tale is about the man in the attic. Hi, Dan and Lindsay. I'm a 25-year-old nursing student and mom of two living in my grandmother's historic home located 20 miles outside of Boston. Wow. It's a large home sitting on four acres of land surrounded by thick New England woods. It was built in 1681. And all additions were finished by the 1750s. Just looking at it, you can see the history and the character. Warmed by five brick fireplaces accompanied with old cast iron beehive ovens from the days before electricity, rough cut lumber uh, rough cut lumber floorboards, and not a damn thing in the house is level, which drives my construction savvy husband crazy. <laughs> Purchased by my grandparents in the 1980s and turned into a small boarding horse farm, this is the home my dad, my aunts, my sister, and I have all grown up in. We've all had experiences with the house's past residents. To tell my story, I need to first give you a little overview of the house, a little overview of the history of the house. Before it was my grandmother's, it served as a meeting house for the Freemasons back in the early days of America. Paul Revere would attend and is recorded to have signed documents in what is now my living room. It has survived multiple fires and still has charred support beams visible in the attic. Wow. Later in the 1800s, it served as the living quarters for the town doctor and down the hallway, the last room on the left, is where he would deliver and care for infants and their mothers. Faint cries can still be heard coming from this general area. The doctor had another structure in what is now our side yard slash writing ring that unfortunately caught fire and burned down in the late 1800s. With a house as old as this one, and with the background it has, there's no question people have died here. I could go on and on with stories about different encounters with different entities, but for time's sake, I'll just tell you about the one who likes to make himself known the most. My entire family simply calls him the man. My first experience happened when I was around the age of three. I don't remember it, but it stuck in my mom's mind vividly. I wasn't even told this story until I was older and had a second encounter with the man. My mom was in college, working at a daycare, and taking care of me while my dad was overseas in the military. One night, she woke to the sound of me laughing. Not crying, laughing. And was I talking to someone? Usually, I awoke in the middle of the night, and if I did, I was scared and crying for her. She found me, this time, sitting on the floor in my room with a puzzle. A puzzle that was definitely up high on my toy shelf and out of reach. And it was half put together. I started excitedly telling her about the man from the attic who came down to play with me. She thought it was odd, 
But as an exhausted, busy working mom in college doing it by herself, I don't blame her for brushing it off and just putting me back to bed. My mom didn't pay it a second thought until years later. My little sister, who had moved into that same bedroom, was about three when she was found sitting on the floor of her room in the middle of the bedroom screaming and unconsolable. And when my mom finally calmed her down and asked her what had happened, she said the scary man from the attic was trying to play with her. My mom immediately connected the two events. She's not big on anything paranormal and is actually very logical and analytical, but this she had no explanation for. My dad was home from the military at that point, and when she told him what had happened, he didn't brush it off as she had expected him to do. My dad, being a very structured, no bullshit kind of guy, surprised her when he said, holy shit, and then went on to explain that when it was his room, he had heard the man. He'd heard him walking the hallway, the wooden floorboards creaking under his heavy, clunky boots, and they'd always stop at his door. He'd get up and see if his own dad was awake, but his dad would be sleeping. He said he was too terrified to sleep in his room as a child and on so many occasions was awoken by those heavy footsteps. Fast forward to today. I'm living in the house with my grandmother. My husband and I are helping her maintain the property along with our two kids and our two 140-pound Bernese mountain dogs. My husband is 6'4", works construction, and always wears heavy work boots. One night, I awoke at about 3 a.m. to my husband's loud, heavy boots walking out of our room. As a sleep-deprived mom of two kids, I was pissed. If we have (laughs) to go to the restroom or get a drink of water in the night, we always do it quietly so as to not wake one another. Why was he being so loud? And where was he going? In my annoyance and general confusion, I sat up in bed, wide awake, full of rage. I saw his tall figure closing our bedroom door behind him as he left. When I looked down, to my dismay, my husband was right next to me. I panicked. There was someone in my house. I woke him up and I told him, there's someone in the house you need to get up now. When I stopped and listened, I didn't hear a thing. Our two dogs, who are very vocal and protective, were silent. And the footsteps, they could no longer be heard. My husband got up, cleared the house, but there was nothing. I told my parents about this encounter, and that's when I found out that the man had paid me a visit in my earlier years, as well as my sister and my dad. As for GTFOing, I'm not in Mm -hmm. any rush. And honestly, I don't feel uncomfortable in this home. While creepy, nothing sinister or harmful has ever happened to me or a loved one here. I actually feel safe. I just go about my life and coexist with the man or whomever Mm -hmm. else might be here. It's pretty mellow here day to day, and it's pretty cool to live in a home with so much history. I know. That's what I was thinking too. It's like, I think that like uh, when it comes to getting the fuck out, you know, of a house because of activity. Yeah. The how, like the quality of the house should weigh into that decision too. Like, yeah. Like outside of the paranormal, it's like, okay, how bad is the haunting and how cool is the house? <laughs> well, and what is the haunting like? And what is, yeah, if it's not like an intimidating, like malevolent haunting, because that does sound like amazing to live in a house like that. I've never, you know, just growing up in the, in the Northwest. Yeah. There is no, as far as European history, European mm-hmm. American history, like goes like uh, old structures. Well, I guess there's like no old structures of any kind, really. Like, you know, Correct. you find some fort here from like the 1800s and it's like, holy shit. Yeah. Like it's been here for over a hundred years. And in uh, in New England, that would be so cool to live in a house like built in the 1600s and have like moments like, oh, Paul Revere signed something like right over there by the uh, TV. I think houses like that are fun to visit. I don't want to live in one. You wouldn't want to live in one that old? In- Old houses, uh, when I was a kid, my mom's boss owned mm-hmm. a house in Massachusetts. Yeah. And we would, uh, he allowed us to stay there. It was like the only way we could take a vacation. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And that house made so many sounds and it was so oh, old and yeah, so creaky. It was beautiful. I mean, it was so beautiful. And as a child, it didn't bother me. But as an adult with all the things that mm-hmm. I now know and doing this show, I don't think I'd want to stay there. I, maybe like for a vacation. Yeah. But I don't think I want to live there. And then also the adult brain in me is like, oh God, and everything's going to be so expensive to fix. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the one knock I would have about like a, a house from that era, just my experience, like visiting those places, like on little tours or whatever, almost like they've been converted into a museum. Yeah. Is um, people seem to be so much tinier back then. <laughs> and the stairs are so tight. Yes, they are. That would drive me crazy. Just as like 
a, little a big bit, guy. Yeah, like yeah, just like a bigger per- where I mean, if I had to like feel like I'm just cramped up walking around and ducking my head to go and I'm not even that tall, but I mean, I've had to duck my head in those houses. Yeah. I'm like, what? Was everyone just so tiny back then? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, they didn't have access to the amount of food that we have access to. So there's that. Yeah. You know, I mean, there were definitely like some bigger people like Abe Lincoln yeah. was a giant human, you know, like relatively right. speaking for the tall. times. Yeah. yeah. Tall, thin, but like you know, talking about ducking, mm-hmm. I just don't think we like, I don't know, our bone it, structure has changed over the years. It is pretty funny when like uh, uh, more on Time Suck, they'll have like descriptions of some like uh, a badass guy, like a big brawler who was like known as a tough guy in this city or in the Wild West in this town. And they'll describe him like, he was a massive man. Five nine. Yeah, no, not, not quite that, but it will be like, it'll be like, he stood at, you know, six six feet tall and he weighed almost 190 pounds. And then and, you think about like LeBron James or something oh and you're God. like, what was he? A, was this guy a tiny that, ant? That guy would be the tiniest guy in our office. He, yeah. He, like I'm the smallest guy in our office. Like there's just a lot of bigger guys. Is Logan guys taller around. than you? Yeah. Lo, lo, yeah. I think he's, um, he's as tall or taller. I think, yeah. I think he actually is a little bit taller than me. Okay. Well, and just like. I know that Tyler is taller than you. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm the like six one and two thirty five ish. I'm the littlest guy in the office. Oh, you poor baby! But it is crazy how like uh, just around here it's like people. But that's what just cracks me up when I read about stuff in history. I'm like, man, they were just so much smaller than at least we they are around a here. Small people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you ready for one more? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for telling us how tall you are and how much you weigh. Yeah, I know everybody was, I was really dying for that information. <laughs> yeah. I just for perspective on what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> just with TC. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> I'm not mad. Easy. <laughs> uh, okay, I've got one more for you about a ghost named Eleanor. Okay. Okay. I really like this story. Greetings, master and mistress of the macabre. I'm sending this anonymously because I'm a federal agent and mm. I don't need my coworkers or superiors knowing what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> this story happened to me and my wife in our newlywed days. Shortly after my wife and I got married, we moved into in an apartment. Nothing unusual there. Happens every day. Not long after we moved in, though, we both felt like we weren't alone. It was little things. I would swear I'd forgotten to turn off the kitchen light when I went to bed, only to find it turned off in the morning. A rocking chair moving on its own. A set of car keys we couldn't find appearing in a spot we both knew we had already looked in. Small, strange things, but nothing scary. When I started working at the sheriff's department on the midnight shift, my wife would sleep on the couch with the TV on because she couldn't sleep in our bed alone. I would tease her, but I couldn't do it either. More than once, my wife had woken up to find the television turned off. This was back in the day when you had to do it by hand since we couldn't afford the ones with the remotes. Needless to say, it freaked her out a bit. It wasn't long before she wanted to GTFO and find a new place to live. Soon, on one of the rare nights we got to sleep together, I had a very vivid dream. In it, my wife and I were sitting at a local outdoor cafe with a lady who seemed to be in her late 80s. She was a very kind lady, and she told us, matter-of-factly, that she used to live in our apartment, and after she passed away, she didn't want to leave. Her name was Eleanor. She figured she'd been dead 10 or so years. She apologized for frightening my wife (laughs) and said that that was never her intention. She was just trying to be helpful. She said we were the first new couple to move in that she actually liked. In the dream, my wife and I chatted with Eleanor like we were old friends. She asked if we were planning on having kids. We admitted we were. And she said she would never come into the bedroom when we were in there unless it was an emergency. In the morning, I told my wife about this strange dream I had. She looked me dead in the eyes and said, Eleanor? (laughs) Uh, Sorry. (laughs) It's just so funny to me. Turned out we had the exact same dream, which I'm guessing wasn't a dream at all. Believe it or not, after that, we didn't want to leave. Eleanor had never caused us any harm. She turned off the lights here and there or shut off the television when my wife fell asleep. We actually felt comfort having her there with us. Life with Eleanor was pretty much like having an elderly aunt living with us. One night when my wife was cooking dinner and was in danger of burning it, Eleanor gained her attention by knocking a glass over, making ah. just enough noise for her to look. Once I was going to bed, my, w- my wife, who was already lying down, asked if I had turned off the hall light. I could see by the light under the door that I hadn't. Groaning, I started to get up to go turn it off when it simply turned itself off. Thank you, Eleanor, I said and laid back down. We said thank you to Eleanor quite a bit. Every now and then, she'd visit us in our dreams. 
We even found out when her birthday was, and my wife uh. actually baked her a cake. We knew she couldn't eat it, but we wanted her to know we thought about her, and she loved that. One night, my younger brother stayed with us. I told him all about Eleanor, but I don't think he believed me. But at about one o'clock in the morning, I heard him yelp, and then I heard him leave. He told me later that he was about half asleep on the couch when someone or something turned the TV off, and then he saw the outline of a person. My wife and I still laugh about that. On another night, when we were in bed asleep, I dreamt she came into our room. She told me to wake up, that someone was trying to get into our apartment. I woke up, looked at my wife, who was already wide awake. She must have had the same dream as me. I grabbed my pistol and my badge, and I told my wife to call the department. I walked quietly into the living room, and sure enough, someone was messing with our door handle. We had a big picture window next to that door. I slid behind the curtain, got a oh. good look at him, before knocking on the window with my gun and waving my badge. Dude took one look at me <laughs> and ran faster than he'd probably ever run in his life. A nearby patrol car was there pretty quickly and saw a sketchy looking guy running like the devil was chasing him. <laughs> Needless to say, they grabbed him and brought him around for me to identify him. They found a pistol on him. Oof. If Eleanor hadn't woken me up, who knows what would have happened. After a while, our attempts at getting pregnant succeeded. Nine months later, our daughter was born. The middle name we chose for her was Eleanor. This pleased our paranormal friend very much. On more than one occasion, we would hear our daughter cooing in her crib when no one was in her room. <laughs> we knew it was Eleanor checking in on her. On a morning after I worked, I was crashed out on the couch trying to get some sleep. In my dream, I heard soft singing coming from the baby's room. I had poked my head in and saw Eleanor rocking and saw Eleanor and the rocking chair next to it uh, going back and forth while hearing singing sweetly to the baby. My daughter was looking at her and seemed very happy. After I woke up, my wife told me she went to check on the baby earlier and did, in fact, see the rocking chair moving on its own and the baby looking at it. I told her about my dream and she just smiled. One more kid later and a third on the way, the apartment was getting to be a bit small. By now, we'd been there for five years. I'd finished school and was leaving the sheriff's department for the federal agency I'm with now, and it was time we bought a house. Eleanor was not happy to hear that, but she understood, though she would miss us and the babies. My wife and I talked about how we wished we could take Eleanor with us. <laughs> we, just, we just felt like she was family. We actually started to talk to psychics and people in the supernatural space about how to bring her with us, but we weren't getting a lot of help because they thought we might invite more than an elderly lady into our new home. Expressing our frustration to Eleanor one night, she told us that it meant so much to her that we even tried to bring her, but she didn't feel like she could leave, and she agreed with the psychics that we might take more than Eleanor with us. She stayed with us until eventually we found a house. The night before we moved out, she came to us one last time. We talked for a long time, and she revealed that she had decided to move on beyond the veil. She was ready to go. We hugged her in the dream, and then she was gone. My wife and I woke up at the same time, my wife was crying, and I'll admit, my allergies were acting up a bit some too. The move was melancholy, but once we were in the new house with more space, things started to get back to normal, and life went on. I know it's a weird story, but even today, decades later, my wife and I still miss our Aunt Eleanor. That's, I love that story. I know, I like did get misty-eyed. It's so <laughs> cute. Yeah, like talk about, I mean, I've talked in, in the past about like what kind of paranormal experience would I want to really have proof. That's like the ideal one. This is it. This is the one and only. I'm like, yep, two thumbs up. Ah, oh, man, that'd just be so crazy to have the same dreams numerous times with yes. the same, especially the first time when you haven't been talking about it. There's no like subconsciously planting it in the other person's head. Yeah. But to wake up like, wait, you just had a dream about some ghost uh, of a woman named Eleanor who lives in our house as well, who said all the same things to you in your dream is, is my dream. Yeah, co-dreaming. Yeah, co-dreaming. And it, like, how cool to have a spirit communicate with you that way and do it repeatedly over years in addition to like lights turning off in a good way. And then actually saving your lives with that, like that burglar, that's like, that, that's like the nicest ghost story I've ever heard. I know. I loved it. Because, you know, obviously, like the whole point of this show is to get like, you know, spoopy and, you know, be on edge. Mm -hmm. But I do every so often like to balance it out with something a little less creepy because where there's, I hope that in life where there's yeah. good, there's like where there's yeah. bad, there's good. Mm -hmm. I, I like the balance uh, mm -hmm. of that. And I just, I thought it was so sweet. And it still adds, I mean, any of these stories still add credibility to the possibility of, you know, the rest of them being true. In, in so, some ways it almost adds more credibility mm -hmm. because sometimes when they're so big and scary, you're like, come on, right. no way. Yeah, 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 totally. But if, you know, Eleanor, the guardian ghost can be true, well then maybe, 
you know, Richard Ramirez, his spirit is going to try and kill you with the Cecil. I I think Eleanor, the guardian ghost, should be like a new character. She'd be like our good protector. We should like invoke her before we start telling our stories okay. to come in and protect us. Will you make? Do you have a pen over there? Will you no. make a note? I uh, won't make uh, any notes. Yes, of course I have a pen. Yeah, if you have, if you have a pen, to make a note that that could be our yeah our good ghost could be Eleanor. I want like you know like okay, well you didn't grow up Catholic, but I did, and okay, growing up um, for anybody. Maybe it was just like my church, but we had yeah. a, the cloister and the cloister was like this little religious store connected to our church. Where you could buy like candy bars and stuff? Like a snack shop? <laughs> Are you being serious? No. <laughs> like if you get like tired during yeah. church, you yeah, could get you a could Snickers? Just, no, you could get like after church snacks. No, mm-hmm. it's like where you went. Priest pops. You could get a little like a, a little like a. That's it. Lollipop shaped like a priest. Uh, well, now I want popsicle molds that look like priests. Priest, priest pops. pops. This okay. is fantastic. I hope Logan's out there taking notes. Um, so priest pops, no, mm-hmm. not a thing. Yeah. Oh boy, I just thought of a really nasty, inappropriate joke about priest pops. I'll mm-hmm. share mm-hmm. with you later. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyways, you could go into the cloister and that's where you would go and pick out like, uh, oh no, is your brain there too? Priest plugs? Uh, no, I was thinking that's where you go to suck a priest off. <laughs> so really sorry about that. Okay. Okay, yeah. anyways. Okay, so that's where you would go to pick out like uh, a very fancy gift for someone uh, for a baptism or you're dying right now, <laughs> yeah, no, <I'm> <laughs> uh, a baptism or a first communion. So it's where I picked out my rosary that I got from my first communion. Mine mm-hmm. was made of um, like amber stones. Like they're really pretty. Anyways, they would yeah. have these tiny little gold guardian angel pins and it came on a card and the card said a little thing about a guardian angel. And I just think it would be so cute to have angel Eleanor's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eleanor on my shoulder. That is so cute. I, I, I was I was uh, having a hard time getting that out because I'm watching no, your wait. face. I know. I was just thinking like for a hidden camera show prank. Oh my God. Like in a very conservative Catholic church with like an older congregation that has that cloister, completely change the products one day. So like they walk in there and there's like a tie, Here we go. Like a tie-dye Mother Mary, but like in a bikini, kind of like a very sexualized Mother Mary like shirt. And and then like, but like just very, like all religious themed, but all like very inappropriate. I was thinking about like lotion. Hey, yeah, no, we just change things up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like some sort of like lotion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and then just talk about like when they complain, it's like, no, oh, you know, we just, you know, things weren't selling and we just try, you try know, to jazz it up spice, a bit. Spicing it up a little bit. Oh my gosh. I always wanted to work in the cloister. I just thought like, this is the best job ever. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why. Like, why does the little kid think things mm-hmm. like that? It's like you, I, I just you, wanted to play with like the cash register. You, you dreamed of selling the, the world's most tasteless crackers? No? All right. Uh, <laughs> I love those wafers. <laughs> I love those. I would always, one time when I was getting communion uh, mm-hmm. at church, the priest accidentally gave me two. They were like stuck together. Uh-huh. And then every time for the rest of my life for receiving communion, I always I was like, please let there be two. Please let there be two. I took communion one time. It wasn't at a Catholic church. It was like Episcopalian where they like do a lot of the same rites. Okay. But without the, and I, I just, I didn't think Jesus would be so bland. <laughs> I thought it'd be spicier cracker. Spicy? Just no, no it's flavor. like it's like um you know those wafer cookies you get that they come in Neapolitan flavors. And they have, <laughs> no, I don't know that a Neapolitan flavored cracker. No, I said they're like yeah they're those the wafer crackers like cookies they're like um it's like you know it has like strawberry in it like kind of like a little you've had them a hundred oh. times at our house they're like it's a wafer and then it's layered. Like, oh yes, see yeah 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 I don't know those yes you do hmm. that's what the that's what the Jesus wafers taste like minus the not flavor where, not the one I, oh <laughs> minus, minus the, the flavor, flavor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I love the crunchy part you know I love crunchy stuff true true I like a crunchy Jesus <laughs> this is the this is an upsetting episode <laughs> I think even my mom would be laughing at this okay. and she's the most Catholic Catholic true she is St. Joan she's oh. a very dedicated Catholic you know what I was thinking when my mom dies I think I'm gonna get a St. Joan tattoo Okay. Like why? not actually her face or anything, but like, wouldn't that be so why, cute? Why wait? Why then they're, they're just kind of like, oh, I can't wait to get this tattoo. And you're kind of like rooting for, just get it now. Her demise? So she can see it. No, she would not be. She she tells my friends that it's like too much that we call her St. Joan. It upsets her. Really? Yeah, because it's too much pressure to live up to. Ah. Uh, that's who my mom is. My mom's like too yeah. sweet, too humble. Mm-hmm. She's like, oh, That's why no, she's St. No. Joan. I know. Of she course St. Joan would not want to be called St. Joan. We have to canonize her later. Yep. Yep. Um, you want to do the Annabelle's first? Sure. This went way off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd like to thank the following Annabelle's for just letting us be weird and just saying stupid, ridiculous things that are sometimes scary and sometimes not. Josie Walters, Teresa N- Not, H N A T, Not, H N A T. Mm-hmm. 
And I spelled it correctly. I looked. I think it's pronounced Hanat. Hanat? No, I have no idea. Hanat? Or is just the H, or is the N silent? <sighs> Hat? Hanat. 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 Teresa, I would like an email about how to say your last name. Uh, bro, bro, McD- <laughs> bro, bro, McDelux. <laughs> All right. Uh, Daniel Ty, Chantel Medina, Ashley Logsdon, Adrian Backus, Caitlin, Caitlin Stockstill. Whew, girlfriend, that's a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> Riga Tony. Riga Tony. R I G A space T O N Y. Nice. That's a great that one. was really good because I didn't Riga get it. Tony. I was like, Riga, what a name. Riga Tony and Riley Caitlin. All right. Thank you for oh, uh, supporting what we do here. Letting us be ridiculous. Uh, also, thank you to the uh, Annabelle's Carla Santos, Nini Marie. That, <laughs> <laughs> that's what, that one's got to be like a nickname. Nini Marie. Um, Sang Lee, Steve Guzman. God, there was an actor. Three Men and a Baby. It was one of the Steve. Oh, oh my No. Dang it. The name is very. Oh, Steve Guzman. Uh, McLean Ballard. Curtis Hodges. I just your face is killing me right now because you're trying to think about Guzman so much. You're like, what is that guy? Steve. I know I can Steve. picture his Steve. Oh, I'm gonna have to look. Okay. Dang it. Uh McLean Ballard, Curtis Hodges, Mike Albright, Jason Schoen, Gutenberg. Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> <laughs> My like finger was on the thing. <laughs> <laughs> he was like famous and then just completely disappeared. It was I such a quick. Talking it was about. such a quick rise and fall. Who was the other guy that was in that? Wait, three men and a baby. Um, Bert is it Bert Reynolds? No. Uh, Tom Selleck. Tom, Tom Selleck. Selleck. Thank you. They look Thank the you. same. No, they don't. Tom Selleck is like a beefier uh, Bert Reynolds. Yeah, they look the same in my brain. And there was one other guy. There was a third man. Ted Danson. Ted Danson. It I forgot Ted Danson? it was Ted Danson. Do we yeah. like Ted Danson? Is he a good guy? Yeah, I don't know. As an actor, he's been around forever. I know, but... I've never heard a bad word about Ted Danson. I might have him... Conv- What's, what do we think about Terry Bradshaw? Did he get in trouble for something? Terry Bradshaw, he gets a little drunk on talk shows sometimes, but... Is that what it is? I think he's fine. He's, th- he's a character. He's a character. That was a weird leap, by the way, from Ted Danson to fucking <laughs> Terry Bradshaw. The T's. Yeah. This, it's just the names. This, it's just the names. This skinny LA actor to this multiple MVP NFL Hall of Fame quarterback. It's just because I read an article about him recently. And so his his name is uh. at the top of my brain. And I said Ted Danson. And then right. da, 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 da. I like to think the following two more animals. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Kelsey, are- <laughs> Kelsey Smurthwaite and Lexus Infinity. It is kind of hot in here, so I am feeling a little loopy. A loopy? Yeah. A little loopy. Told you it was hot. And that is our show. Thanks for continuing to send in your uh, personal bro, tales. Can I do some spooby shout No, I, we don't have time today. Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales. Of t- we'll do spooby shout next week. You, yeah, go. Phew. You're busted. <laughs> uh, okay. To John from your daughter, EC. Happy birthday to my old man. Can't believe you're 40. Keep up the spooks. Love you so much. 40 is not old. You better watch it. <laughs> to Panda from Jelly Bean, happy anniversary and happy early birthday. Okay. To Buster Banana from Cincy Strawberry, uh, Cindy Strawberry and Huffy Puffy. Huffy Puff. You guys, this is tough. To Buster Banana from Cindy Strawberry and Huffy Puff. Happy birthday. We love you. To Bug from Madre. So proud of you for graduating from UNC Charlotte and for being the amazing young man you are. I love you. And to Brock from Jade Allison. Happy birthday and congrats on becoming a dad. Enjoy your new Annabelle status that she gifted him. That's nice. I would love it if somebody sent in a spooky shout out that was like, Dear John, congratulations on being a dad. It's not yours. Oh. Like just like some really (laughs) awkward twist, but like just a joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys want to send in some funny ones. I'm into it. (laughs) Uh, So now that's our show. Uh, thanks for continuing your send in your personal tales of terror to my story scared to death podcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scared to death podcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith, Tyler C for the work on social media and to uh, Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Thanks to Tyler C for producing and directing today. I was almost going to call him the Suck Ranger, but it doesn't apply in the show. Well, you could call uh, him that. People know. Yeah. Zach, uh, Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation. You could be the Scare Ranger. <laughs> Heather, that's a very different vibe. The scare ranger compared to the- well, because scared to death, he's like yeah, he's wrangling up the scares. Are you saying I'm scary? No, I'm yeah, saying Lizzie, you're wrangling you saying? up the scares. <laughs> Heather, God. thanks to Heather Ryder for the ongoing my story emails. Uh, to book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number four. Uh, I uh, also and thanks to uh, Steve Gutenberg for <laughs> being like easily in the top forty of comedic actors from the late '80s to early '90s. I found the first story I told this week. 
Thanks to Olivia. What's happening in this episode? Thanks to Olivia Lee for finding the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch this show. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you uh, want more content. See pictures that accompany each episode at Scared to Death Podcast. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers. And on TikTok, at Scared to Death Podcast. Going to be shaking up the content there. You can also find Steve Gutenberg on social media. I believe it's at Steve Gutenberg. Uh, just send him a little thank you for you know the work he put in on Three Minute Baby. Just tag him in this episode. Tag him. Uh, I don't even know if he's still around, but if he is, I'm, sh- I'm sure he wants to hear. Do you from think you. he's dead? He might be. He's not that know. old. He Tom was. Selleck's still alive, yeah. People don't people don't always make it to old age. Steve Gutenberg. All right, peace. Rest in peace to Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> if you do happen to no longer be around. And if you are still around, we hope to hear from you. If, if you don't you're not wa- around, I hope you find on Eleanor the ghost. You guys can hang out together. <laughs> if you don't want to hear any ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, uh, check out our Patreon. Get the entire catalog ad-free and so much more. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps, and peepers. And hope Steve you Gutenberg. were scared to Steve Goomberg. <laughs> if spirits threaten me in this place, fight water, by water, and fire, fight fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scare to death. And Magic Productions. Jason Schoen. Gutenberg! Steve Gutenberg! <laughs> <laughs> My like finger was on the thing. It was like, <laughs>